Hello, everyone. Hi. Hello. I want to figure out how to do a background so it's not my guest. <laughs> I tried to do a background, but it wouldn't let me. Could anyone figure it out or not so much? I don't know. I'm just embracing it. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, this is I... our authentic selves. <laughs> Great. So we, we are live. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining, especially our, our panelists. Uh, throughout COVID, Loop has, has been launching several of these um, series just to update people on how the platform is progressing, celebrating um, some of our the launches and milestones that we've been able to, to hit as a platform. And, and today we have actually a wonderful group here to talk about Loop coming to Canada. So I, I want to thank everybody uh, for joining, both uh, participants who, who are coming in, but also for our panelists. Uh, we'll, we'll kick off with a round of, of introductions. I'm, I'm speaking, so I'm, I'm happy to go first. My name is Tony Rossi. I am the Vice President of Business Development for both TerraCycle and Loop. I've been with the company for for about 10 years now and in 2017 when we started to incubate the idea for the loop platform within TerraCycle I was fortunate enough to 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 be on that team and have spent the last three years really ensconced in in what we've been doing with respect to to reusability and um, again that includes Canada and that's what we're going to talk about today so with that said, I'm, I'm just going to my right. I'm going to, to pass it over to Tara and let you introduce yourself. Hi, thanks so much. Uh, my name is Tara McKenna. Um, I've created uh, the website uh, and blog, the Zero Waste Collective, as a place to have conversation about low waste living. Um, and it's now like my full time career. And hopefully I can help to inspire and learn from other people to live a low waste lifestyle. Uh, my interest in low waste living was triggered specifically when I was traveling in Bali a number of years ago. I was snorkeling and unfortunately saw a lot of um, trash intermingling with fish. And I know that's like um, becoming, you know, a well-known experience in the Southeast Asia context. Um, but that was quite a few years ago. And my professional background is actually uh, urban and regional planning. And so um, I worked at the provincial level before going out in, into entrepreneurship um, in environmental land use planning. So I'm particularly passionate about uh, natural, like nature conservation, and the circular economy is, is super important and plays an integral role into uh, enabling nature conservation. So I'm super pumped to learn more about where Luke is going with uh, supporting the circular economy. So thank you so much for having me today. Wonderful, thank you, Tara. Um, going around, let's let's put Matt on the spot. Matt, thank you for joining and uh, let us all know who you are. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Matt Livingston. I'm the sustainability and stewardship specialist for Nature's Path Foods. Um, so we're, if you don't know who we are, um, we're a very large, uh, organic uh, breakfast food manufacturer. Um, and yeah, I have the joy of uh, sort of leading and spearheading um, our sustainability initiatives um, across the company. And uh, one of those fun projects I get to work on is The Loop. And uh, I've been specifically tasked with uh, helping to launch all of our SKUs here in Canada. Um, and yeah, my sustainability journey is kind of like a long one, but I guess I sort of came to the world of food sustainability more from the organic side of things and learning about the importance of that. Um, and then sort of once you start to um, think critically about the food you're eating, you start to get turned on to the, um, you know, the way that food uh, and packaging are so intertwined from a waste perspective. Um, and that's kind of brought me full circle here. And uh, yeah, the Loop platform is just one that I'm super passionate to work on and uh, excited to be here and talk about it. Amazing. Thank you, Matt. And last, certainly not least, uh, over to you, Nicole. 
Hi, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so my name is Nicole Fisher. I'm head of sustainability for Kraft Heinz Canada. It's doing very similar role to Matt uh, over here at Kraft Heinz. Um, I'm sure people are familiar with our products from Heinz ketchup to Kraft dinner to Philadelphia cream cheese. Um, so in about 97% of Canadian households um, and as the largest food manufacturer in Canada, you know, really have a responsibility um, to ensure that we're, we're driving sustainability and making an impact uh, for our consumers in Canada. So my journey with sustainability is actually more recent. Uh, I joined the party um, about uh, a year ago, actually, when I returned from my uh, third mat leave. Prior to that, I was my history is marketing at Kraft Heinz and at Unilever prior to that. Um, and uh, we created a new group called Growth and Sustainability, and they asked me if I wanted to be head of sustainability. And I did highlight that uh, they did hire me and are familiar with my resume and my education, <laughs> and that I, you know, don't in fact have, uh, you know, my degree in environmental science nor my my, uh, my work experience. But I think there was sort of uh, there was some method to the madness. Um, a lot of the challenges that some of the large organizations have is around connecting our larger ESG goals and commitments to our consumers through our brands, and how do we tell those authentic, meaningful, and relevant brand stories to our consumers. So um, hopefully I can lend that skill set here. And Loop, you know, is a perfect uh, story for us in terms of taking our iconic, you know, Heinz ketchup glass bottle and with the, the circular platform being able to make it reusable in Canada. So it's just one of our um, sustainability commitments towards sustainable packaging, which we'll talk more about later. Um, but that's why Loop is really exciting for us. Uh, and we're, we're glad to partner with you guys to, to bring it to more Canadians. Perfect. Uh, so thank you everyone for, for those introductions. I, I always find it fascinating to hear people's, uh, how people came into sustainability. And what's always wonderful from my personal perspective is that the ability to combine passion for sustainability and wanting to do the right thing for the environment in our careers at you know larger companies, obviously Loop is much smaller than Kraft Heinz and Nature's Path and uh, Tara's uh, work with, with the Zero Waste Collective. But I, I love that intersection between, between businesses and, and sustainability. So um, again, thank you everybody for those introductions. So let's, let's move now into uh, really talking through, I'll give just a general overview of, of Loop's launch in Canada. And then I'd, I'd love to also touch on, you know, how Loop is going to work within the Canadian culture specifically, because you know, as a Canadian myself, I know I know we're much different than 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 other countries and markets that that Loop has launched in around the world, and and also how Loop ties into your sustainability goals uh, as a as a company as well. So I'm I'm happy to start just talking a little bit about. About actually, I'm going to start with TerraCycle and 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 the journey into um, into Loop, and then how it came to Canada and some of our goals, um, and then pass it over to the team. So, for those who don't know, Loop Loop is a TerraCycle company. Uh, we've been around for 20 years, and we've always we're a mission driven company. Our mission is is to eliminate the idea of waste, and for 20 years we've primarily been doing that through making products and packaging recyclable and making things whether it be products or packaging from recycled content and then like i said earlier in 2017 we were actually at the world economic forum with one of our partners unveiling a product that was made from recycled beach and ocean plastic and while we were there this was right after david attenborough's Blue Planet came out, sustainability was really on the tips of everybody's tongue and top of everyone's mind. And the conversation at the World Economic Forum almost revolved around exclusively recycling and making things from recycled material, which you would think would be a perfect for a company who did those two things. Uh, but our CEO being, being the ingenious person that he is, went back and started to think about our mission of eliminating waste. And, and the simple truth is that if we project into the future, 10, 20, 50 years, I feel as though we would be failing as a society if we're still living in a single use or linear economy or society. And that's where Loop was born. And what Loop is, 
it is an attack on disposability, right? And it is a platform for reusability. And for us, you know, we were lucky enough to work with Craft and Nature's Path and Mondelez and Unilever and PNG, some of our, our partners for, for a really long time. And with those core partners, we we launched Loop in, in the United States and in France in, in 2019, in the summer of 2019. But zeroing in on Canada, what our Loop launch did was pique the attention of Loblaw. And the retailer is a huge piece in, in the loop platform because, and I'm sure you're gonna see from, from Craft and from Nature's Path that we're asking them to continue to make the products that everybody loves just in durable packaging. And that's a key stakeholder in loop. But another key stakeholder is Loblaw, is the retailer to get these products into the hands of, um, of the Canadian consumer. So, the interest from Loblaw and our brand partners, especially Canadian brand partners like Nature's Path, to drive Loop both in the United States, but also to bring it to Canada, was the starting point for us being able to, to offer Loop in Canada. And it obviously went uh, live a couple of weeks ago in Canada. And that was about an 18 month journey from inception to now it's live. So that's, it was, it was a very organic, um, very organic transition for us, but one that was definitely spearheaded by our Canadian retail partner in Loblaws, um, but also our brand partners who wanted to see Loop north of the border. So maybe with, with that said, I'll, I'll turn it over to, to first Matt and then Nicole to, to talk about you know how Loop is, is relevant for, for your um, brands, your products, in Canada, how that relates to your sustainability goals. And maybe after when you're done, I'd love Tara to get your input on maybe the Canadian culture and how that relates to zero waste and reusability. So without further ado, let's, we'll go Matt and then Nicole. Yeah, thanks. Um, so yeah, um, I would say Loop fits perfectly within all of our sustainability goals. Um, we're a family owned company um, and the family is quite passionate about sustainability. And that's a big reason of why they started the company. Um, it was founded sort of on the sentiment of leaving the earth better than you found it. Um, and that sort of uh, embodies the soil as well as like being an organic company, but it also involves obviously waste. Um, and so there's a big commitment top down to sort of do something about the amount of single use plastic we put out into the world. Um, and so we are sort of originally signed on to the Ellen MacArthur um, commitment, which is to have all packaging in either recyclable, compostable or reusable by 2025. Um, and what's awesome about Loop is um, really, ideally, we would be all reusable. Like, um, I think Loop sort of gives us the power as sustainability people to, to have like a real option. Um, I think a lot of times when we're looking at single use packaging, we're, we're truly picking the best of the worst. Um, and it doesn't always make me feel that great um, as much as I understand that it's a bit of a byproduct of the ecosystem of the way we sell groceries. Um, but Loop seems to be the most real option in terms of it doesn't create the waste. Um, so in terms of our commitment of recyclable, compostable, reusable, obviously we would love it to all be reusable. But I think, um, like you said, Anthony, I think it's it's crucial that the retailers play a, a part in that. Um, and that's what the beauty of Loop is, is that it's kind of getting the retailers and the brands to sort of start thinking about it in a new way, in a new ecosystem, because I think we get trapped in the whole way we've always done business, make it single use, send it out, they take it, and we just kind of move on with our day. Um, and so I think Loop has kind of given us power to actually do something more real. Um, so there's a lot of commitment behind it, I think, at Nature's Path, um, which feels very nice. And obviously, we're a Canadian company, so it makes sense. Uh, we're all been really excited to see it in Canada. I'm over here on the West Coast in Vancouver. I would love it uh, to come out here sooner than later because I can't wait to order. Uh, but I know I have friends back east um, who are excited to see it arrive. Um, and I think, I don't know, I think Canadians just, we have a strong uh, tie to the natural world. We have so much green space um, and I think we value it. And I think that that kind of leads to um, us having a, a bit of a strong sentiment around environmentalism. 
Thanks, Matt. No, I mean, I couldn't agree more with everything you said extremely eloquently. Um, similar to Nature's Path, we have a corporate uh, sustainable packaging goal around getting 100% of our packaging recyclable, compostable, or reusable by 2025. Um, so agreed, you know, the Loop platform is really a way to accelerate the, the reusable part of that for sure, which I agree with Matt, you know, needs to take an increasing importance um, as we look at the overall waste ecosystem. You know, and if we think of the hierarchy, um, refuse, which we're obviously not very good at, <laughs> reduce, which we're tr trying to probably do, but also probably not doing such a stellar job on, and then uh, reuse. So I think to your point, Anthony, there is a lot of focus on on recycling and the recycling system. Um, and I think there has to be great work there on how to fix that. And I, there's a lot, we're in a great position in Canada, but I think we all know there's a lot more that we can, we can do to get to a, a more circular uh, economy for plastics and ensure we have zero plastic waste. Um, and, you know, one of those initiatives uh, will help us get there is the Canada Plastics Pact. So that's something that recently launched, which we're a founding signatory of. And I know a number of other organizations across the plastics value chain. So really commitments like that where we're coming together across industry, government, NGO, um, you know, to solve these issues, I think is really important. Um, but Loop is, you know, is a great example of how you can take an idea and really bring it to a sort of a commercial scale because to Matt's point, we there's a system of you know how we make and sell products, that linear uh, model that all of our organizations are built on and to reframe that and rethink that is is quite significant. So it requires all of all of these actors to work collaboratively um, to change the way we think and help consumers change the way they consume. Um, so I think, you know, we all need to work on that together and we're sort of taking our first step. I think we'll learn so much through the loop pilot um, and then looking forward to being able to scale that up once it moves into retail. Because I think, as we all know, when we get to scale is when we'll really see the magic happen. Um, so looking forward to that. Agreed. So, so Tara, over, over to you. I'd love to get your thoughts on, you know, how, how do you think this relates and plays into Canadian um, culture and, and some of the choices that they make when they're shopping and when when we live our lives. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I, I've given this some thought and really it, it's hard to paint all of Canada with the same brush. Obviously, it's an incredibly diverse country. So what sustainability looks like for someone living in a more urban area versus like a more rural setting, or if you're in Northern Canada versus Southern, like there's so many different contexts, but from all of the traveling I've done, I think there's definitely, you know, um, a sentiment towards, you know, anti-litter. So people in Canada are not so much into littering and, and it's not that people want to litter, it's just a, a cultural thing here, right? I think that there's a, a strong sense of like, it's important to recycle, it's important to not litter. But at the same time, I also think it's really, you know, when people buy products, you know, they're buying them for the products and not for the waste. It's not like, you know, people go to McDonald's thinking like, oh, I wanna create a bunch of waste today, so I'm gonna go get a bunch of takeout. And I think that the pandemic has also, you know, really made it more challenging for people to avoid waste. And certainly like as someone who is seeking a low waste lifestyle, it is definitely a lot harder these days. And, you know, with the lockdown and you want to support restaurants and you're like, okay, well, how do I support restaurants if it's going to create waste because of takeout anyway? So there's, you know, but I, I think there's a lot of support for making it easier to be sustainable. And that's what I like about Loop is it's making it easy for everybody because not everybody is, you know, keen about sustainability. Not everybody's having the conversations about how to reduce trash, even if it's everybody's problem, you know, we all, you know, share this planet. Um, but there's definitely, I think, a strong interest towards making it easier. Um, and I think that Canadians as a whole would welcome opportunities to reduce their waste, whether or not, you know, they're as keen as we are per se, you know, we're pursuing it, we're passionate about it, but not everybody should have to be passionate about it in order to reduce their impact. And And Loop is really enabling people to make it easier um, for everyone to reduce their waste without having think, to think too much about it. And I think because people do like the convenience of shopping online, then, you know, that's also filling that like shop online gap of like, okay, well, you can shop online and reduce your waste at the same time. It's, it's pretty sweet. Um, and I think this is coming in at a really good time because 
you know, pandemic is high, like climate change and, and plastic ocean waste and all these things were really coming to a head in the last few years. Um, and so when I think about like the Canadian context, we've got, you know, the, the federal government moving towards banning single use plastics. Um, and I've made, I've like made a little list here, but like bags, stir sticks, uh, cutlery straws, those things are being banned by the end of this year. And, and with the goal of eventually moving towards zero plastic waste um, in the next like decade. So that is really coming to a head with what is happening with Loop. And I think with all these conversations, it will be definitely welcoming within the Canadian context. Yeah, I think that's really, you, you touched on a lot of good things there. Um, first though, I, I have to address one of the things that Nicole said about refuse. Um, it, that that That's the big one, I think, when it comes to sustainability is, you know, really, do we do we need everything that we have, right? Uh, and and I was colloquially, I was in an interview a few years ago, and I was, you know, I'm showing my age here, talking about the three R's, and the the very young, incredibly smart person said, "Excuse me, Tony, I believe you're you're missing the first R, which is refuse." Um, so it's it's great to to kind of reiterate that uh, as always. I I did want to I think as I think about loop and as I've been speaking to, to retailers and companies around the world, I think something that, again, this is just my opinion and we have a, a couple minutes that, that if you guys want to weigh in, please do. I think what's fascinating about the Canadian consumer is in Canadian brands and retailers, we have this connection with nature that maybe other countries don't have, you know, we're privileged to see it. Uh, even though I, I say this as I lived in Toronto, but you know we have so many green spaces and 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 lakes and mountains in such a diverse country, um, and and we're really passionate about keeping it clean and pristine. But sometimes that doesn't always relate directly to to helping increase recyclability. So I like I always pick on my wife, who's who's from Victoria, BC, and and something of a hippie. For her, she loves putting everything in the blue bin. Right, and I'm taking it out of garbage, and I'm not littering it, and I'm putting it in my blue bin. And we have this culture sometimes of, of wish cycling. And I think when we launched Loop in Canada, even like the colloquial friend or family member who never reached out to me in ten years at TerraCycle reached out when it came to Loop because they said, "Ah, reusability. I get that." I'm removing some of the bin confusion. So that's something that I'm really excited about, specifically in Canada, is making sustainability and the, the choice to be sustainable easier and clearer to the consumer. So I, I don't know if if anybody has any thoughts on that or wanted to chime in, uh, disagree, agree, uh, but I'll, I'll open it up to the floor. I would, I know, I would say I 100% I agree. It's funny, I was just having this discussion with my five, six-year-old now last night as I'm putting him to bed because I was telling him I was doing this and I was trying to talk about refuse and do, do we really need everything we have and all the toys and anyway, he's having a bit of a hard time with wrapping his head around. Um, but I think you make, you know, I think it's a really great point. Um, and in terms of Canadians and their sustainability preferences, um, you know, we've spent the last few months doing quite an in-depth piece of research with Canadians to understand what does sustainability mean to them in food and beverage? You know, what do they expect us to do? Um, and uh, and what are the things that they care about? And how does it differ from other countries? Um, and so about 80% of Canadians are, you know, state they're concerned with some facet of sustainability. And, you know, for Canadians, environmentalism is very much sort of the key pillar of that. So there's also, you know, the sort of animal welfare and social justice, but for Canadian sustainability really means environmentalism. Um, and what was interesting is when you looked at some of the issues, an issue where we were significantly higher than the US with single use plastics and plastic waste, it was 24% higher than US caring. And I think that goes back to the points around the federal government and, and the role that they play in sort of heightening the awareness and the commitments that we're making as a society towards getting to, to zero plastic waste. Um, and then specific to grocery, before we, we launched on Loop, we did a survey to ask Canadians their expectations. And you know, 83% wanted to reduce packaging on groceries and 78% actually wanted zero waste solutions like Loop. So I think there's a huge desire. Um, and I think making it 
easy and accessible is, is key. And what I love, um, what Tom talks about also is not just the sustainability piece, but uh, the consumer experience. So how can you not just make it uh, reusable, but actually address any barriers or issues that you know they had with the product to give them a more positive consumer experience? And I love the the Hagen Dazs example. Um, you know, how can you make eating ice cream better than it was before through something reusable? So it's not just about the environmental benefit, but it's also about the consumer experience and heightening that um, and and addressing any barriers there. So. Mm-hmm. I completely agree, Nicole. Um, so let's let's move on. I think while we're painting an incredibly rosy picture, we're all coming to to loop um, opening in Canada with a ton of enthusiasm and positivity. But this is hard, right? This is <laughs> I, I see a lot of nodding heads. This this isn't easy. So I, I'd love to to focus on on maybe some of the unique challenges we have right now and, and I'm I'm happy to to kick it off uh, and then I'd, I'd love to go to, to Tara first this time uh, maybe as somebody right like Matt and Nicole you guys are in the trenches working on products and packaging but Tara I'd love to get your opinion on, on what the challenges is maybe a consumer or, or the culture but I'll start with 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 loops challenges again this is this is going to be the this is the fourth market that we've opened in loop around the world. So we have a little bit of learnings. Um, And right out of the bat, or out of the gate, excuse me, I'll I'll piggyback on what Nicole said earlier. Scalability is something that that is always the biggest challenge, right? We we need to start, right? Sometimes that's the hardest thing to, 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 to do, but ultimately at some point we need to address concerns of scalability because that's important to us as loop as we run uh, a lot of our cleaning and infrastructure um, in canada i'm sure for our partners who may be filling differently and i'll let you guys touch on that in a second and, and even our retail partners right how does this um how does this move on shelf does it work together with uh, their e-commerce uh, what does loops e-commerce look like moving forward so scalability is just a huge one um and i think that's going to come but it's it's something that needs to be addressed and it definitely affects pricing and, and how people and who can access the platform but again a uniquely canadian challenge i would say is is geography canada is a big country right the the gta is a big region ontario is an enormous province um, and then how do we bring loop to as many Canadians as possible is something that, that we have to think really long and hard about, because as soon as we said loop is coming in Ontario, automatically folks in Quebec say, well, when is this coming to Quebec? And to Matt's point, when am I going to be able to order this in BC? So I think that's one of the challenges that, that we have to think about internally and, and how we provide the correct infrastructure to enable Loop to, to come to as many Canadians as possible. So that's that's my spiel right now. Um, but as promised, maybe over to you, Tara. Thanks, and that's a good point because it, it's not just Loop that has that challenge, like waste management for all of Canada, Ontario, it's, it's a challenge too, right? Because you know how easy is it for someone in a northern remote location to recycle compared to someone living in Toronto? So no doubt it's going to be hard to figure out what does scalability look like, what does access look like as you grow. So I commend you on uh, going forth with that, but I'm sure the solutions will come as as opportunities arise. Um, But I think another thing that is a really important concern to me when I think about, you know, my community and discussions I've had on social media and on my blog is affordability. Because even when I've talked to a lot of my friends about low waste living and how like when I hit the produce section of a grocery store, I'm filtering based on what I can find that comes naked you know, that doesn't have a plastic package, if possible, can I get, you know, the broccoli without packaging? But then when I talk to my friends about it, you know, they're looking at another layer here, because for me, I prioritize, okay, yeah, I've got a budget, but how can I figure that out in in a low waste way? But then they make a good point. They're like, okay, well, if I see a bag of lettuce that's packaged, and it happens to be cheaper than a bag of lettuce that, you know, isn't packaged and, and, and there's no other layers, not like it's not like it's organic because sometimes you'll find that 
packaged organic is more expensive. But, you know, if the cheaper option happens to be packaged in plastic, why is someone go, going to go for the, you know, uh, naked option? So I think that affordability is going to be a really, really important component and perhaps a challenge because as things get more complex, they get more expensive. And that also is another layer of like, okay, well, if you're dealing with a remote location, how do you make that affordable? So, um, Obviously, I don't have any answers for what that that question, you know, brings, but that's definitely something that needs to be considered. And, and I'm sure you've considered it. So definitely, if you have a moment to, you know, perhaps uh, add to that, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. I think on affordability, it is one of the things that often comes up when we're speaking about loop. Um, and, and that's where scalability and, and, and I don't want to kind of take too much from, from Matt and Nicole here, and, and they'll be uh, able to talk about it better than I would. But I think scalability is the path to affordability, right? When, when we're looking at Loop now, the MOQs or minimum order quantities that, that we're, we're targeting for our brand partners um, are, are not what they're typically used to. And, and what I've seen is that, or what, I, again, not to take too much from Matt and Nicole, I would say, for some of these companies, they've been around for decades, maybe a hundred years. And in that time, they've been making the single use experience so efficient. And here we are completely changing the game, right? Where we're asking a behemoth of a company to make a sharp turn and, and there are challenges there. So with that said, um, maybe I'll turn it over to Matt and talk about maybe some of the challenges that, that you're overcoming and, and have overcome um with with nature's path and then we'll we'll go to nicole after that yeah thanks i think you hit the nail on the head with uh scalability is probably one of the biggest challenges um i think in terms of just getting it to amount a number of people um it's challenging but then from our side as well um it's challenging in it's kind of easier in the small scale where it's like very manual and we're just doing these small runs it starts to get a little more challenging in that sort of medium scale where it's like we we aren't at a point where we're going to invest in buying a whole line of packaging machines to package specifically into reusable we hope that this scales to that size and then we're committed to making those changes um, but until we sort of get that volume running through the system um, it's still quite a manual um, process but i think the beauty of reusable packaging is we are reusing it so the more we reuse it the more like the better margin we make on our products um, so there is sort of that internal selling point of um, with scale can bring affordability both for the consumer and better margins for the company. Um, and so it, it is, uh, it, the path is there. It's just trying to walk it right now, I think is really the challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, we've dealt, we're, we're basically dealing with those challenges right now in terms of um, we want to add more SKUs, we want to do more with Loop, um, but obviously every single thing we go to do adds some sort of complication because the factories are not optimized for this. So it's, do we even have space to do the packing? How can we pack this? What, what kind of box is it even going to go into before it ships? Um, you yeah. have sort of those very simple op, uh, operational ones, but um, also um, you just have a lot of uh, challenges in terms of this is different than what we do. Like you said, um, we've been doing things a certain way for a long time. Um, and the operations folks who are, are lovely at Nature's Path, but I think sometimes when we're like more skews into the loop, um, you can see a little bit of a panic kind of start. Um, but I think that's the sort of dance. It's like, you know, uh, when you get those reactions that you're doing something right, you are pushing the limits because if your ops people are just like, got it, yeah, we're on it, you probably haven't pushed it that hard. Um, so we're really trying to find that balance and uh, understand the operational concerns and uh, try to mitigate them as best we can and sort of figure out how we adapt our, our system to work that way. But yeah, it, it's super complicated. Even making uh, financial documents, it's different than how you would calculate single use. Um, it's just a wealth of difference, but that's also kind of what makes it fun and kind of what pulls people, I think, into wanting to work on it is it is a break from normal. And I think 
most people get it. It's like, I think sometimes with this reusability, I feel like we get a little ahead of ourselves and it's like, oh, the reusable ecosystem. And it's like, it's really just sort of Tupperware, you know, that we're washing and delivering to people. Um, and I think we do that in our own homes. It's not like everybody has single use plastic plates in their cupboard mm -hmm. and they just rip through them, throwing them in the garbage. Like the concept of reusing it and washing it so you don't end up with a million plates in your garbage makes a lot of sense to people. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think sometimes just simplifying it down to, re to really make people realize that it's like, this isn't actually that crazy. Like we can do this, we can modify things, we can, we can get there. Um, I think uh, is sort of what we need to do is just kind of hold people's hands and make sure that we all know we, we can do this together. Yeah, that's uh, that's amazing, Matt. And and I, if I'm if I'm grinning here and, and look kind of crazy, it's Matt used the the term like middle path, not startup, uh, or or not at the beginning. But he said we're we're in the the middle now, not high, but middle. And and for somebody who's been working on Loop for three years, it's so refreshing to hear and to see like we're we're making progress. Like we started from nothing, and in like two years that the program has been live, we're talking about adding SKUs. So that's that's really cool. And, and I think well, one of the things that was fascinating for me um, before I turn it over to, to Nicole, with Nature's Path, this wasn't a tweak on your packaging. This was something completely new, right? The, the packaging that you've come to market with that wasn't something that was in your supply chain. That was that was a full turn, and and it's amazing to see how quickly you were able to move internally to to get something into the hands of consumers. And you know, I, I again don't want to speak too much for you, but if there are you know learnings that happen from that initial push and how that's going to influence um, you know packaging moving forward, I think is is really really cool. So. It's, it's amazing to be here, again, less than two years after launch and talk about learnings, talk about, you know, how how this is coming to a new market, adding SKUs. Like, it's, it's tremendous to see the speed with which you guys have moved. Yeah, thanks. Um, definitely, like, I mean, tons of complications just being an organic brand. We've had to ensure that um, we've had to work pretty close to it, the loop team to figure out the mm -hmm. washing procedure to ensure that we we stayed compliant through all of that. Um, and yeah, I mean, tons of stuff, just like even looking into doing metal and trying to do, um, we do x-ray for foreign objects for metal flakes. Um, mm -hmm. So if we go to a metal container, we can't use that process anymore. Um, I, I can hear our uh, QA manager kind of, it's kind of her nightmare a little bit, but um, <laughs> it, is, it is cool. So yeah, there's just, I could sit here and talk for hours about the challenges, but they're kind of fun to just like tick them off. And uh, yeah, it's been cool to work with the Loop team to do that too. Amazing. Um, so I guess over to you, Nicole. What challenges have you faced, if any, right? Or is it? Oh no, it's just been smooth sailing for us over here. Um, no, I mean I think all of the challenges that that Matt brought up and you brought up are 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 real. The struggle's real uh, for us as well. Um, I think when it boils down to it, all all the manufacturers are in this because it is the right thing to do and because we want to change the paradigm. Um, I think I'm pretty safe to say nobody's making money on this right now, um, quite the opposite. I think we're all investing on multiple sides in order to bring this to life. So I see some questions coming through in the chat around, you know, how is it affecting product margins and how much is getting passed on to the consumers? Um, you know, at least on our part right now, we're eating it to as a test and learn to figure it out. And I'm sure um, many, you know, other manufacturers are as well. Um, because we wanna make sure that it's affordable and accessible and that the sustainable choice um, doesn't have to be the more expensive choice. And you know, the research that I was referring to, number one barrier, surprise, surprise, to being more sustainable is cost and people's you know, feeling of their, their income not allowing them to make those more sustainable choices. Um, so that's obviously a challenge. You can't continue in a model that loses money forever. Um, but our, our mentality has been very much, and, and this came you know, from our UK team who launched uh, first with, with Heinz Ketchup uh, in July last year, which was great to sort of fast follow and learn from them. Test and learn. I mean, the number of times I said, test and learn to my cross-functional team, to my supply chain, to my, it's like, calm down everyone. We're testing and learning. It's a pilot. It's, you know, we're getting consumer insights. Like, let's all breathe. <laughs> um, 
because I think that's really what that this first phase is. And with all of that learning, we'll be able to build in, you know, how can we adjust our supply chain? What are the new quality procedures? Um, how do we make sure we have traceability? All, all those things we're learning together. Um, but right now, you know, as you said, it's small MOQs. Uh, we're testing and learning, but as we figure that stuff out together and we're able to scale up, you know, as again, there's great comments from the Q&A about agreeing that with that scale comes access, comes affordability. And we're, you know, we're all on this journey together uh, to figure out how to do it. So it's, it makes sense for all. So it is a sustainable business model and a sustainable product for, uh, for the consumers. Yeah. Um, and, and with, with Kraft Heinz, I know we started with ketchup and maybe a little bit differently than, than nature's path who had to find um, a, a new package, a new container, a new material uh, for their product. When we look at Kraft Heinz, it's, it's actually going back. It's something that's incredibly iconic, but by no means does that mean there wasn't any work to be done, right? Like even something as simple, and, and I, I say simple as somebody who's never worked in, in CPG or, but a labeling change, there's a lot of work that goes into that. And, and I think for me, one of the, the pieces that, that never ceases to amaze me is how many people, how many business units uh, internally are involved in making loop happen. This isn't a sustainability exercise unto itself. It involves operations, right? It involves supply chain. It involves lovely QR people, right? When, when we're talking about loop, even before this thing called COVID came, health and safety was, was one of the preeminent concerns about loop. How are we going to, to clean and sanitize this packaging so that it can be refilled with confidence legally so that it can be resold again? Um, but even things like communication, like I love, um, Nicole, you talked about with the UK team. I I could be wrong, but I'm, I'm almost entirely sure that the Kraft Heinz bottle in the UK has a royal warrant on it, um, which for those of you who may not know, if uh, it's it's in association with... with um, with the British monarchy, if it's a product they use, you can get a warrant on that. And the legislation and rules involved around communication on a product that has a royal warrant, you know, that that's a work stream that takes months. So I, I it never ceases to amaze me how much work loop involves and how many functions and, and people internally that, that this does involve. And it's, again, it's, I, I think it's really amazing that we are where we are today. And, and to kind of jump ahead to some of the questions that people may ask is concerns around assortment. There aren't many products that I use, um, but, but to get to the assortment that we're at today, it, it took quite a long time. And I think, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, um, guys, but, traditional development of a product or a package can be anywhere from, from a 12 to 24 or even 36 month uh, work stream to get something new in, into, into the public's hands. So um, the fact that you guys have already done this is, is pretty, pretty amazing. One more question, because we have a little bit of time before we, we address the, the audience's question, but something that Matt touched on, and even you did as well, Nicole, is space in a warehouse. And I think when we talk about loop and we, we look at the COVID effect, I assume that as food providers, right, that's, that's the core of both of your businesses, keeping grocery sell, shelves stocked with your, your regular product has probably been an amazing challenge that, that you guys had to go through special circumstances. So to, to maybe if you just want to hint on like how you were able to even carve some space out for Loop and your teams, I think, you know, I, I'm always interested because I, I know the, the demands that you guys are under. Uh, yeah, um, I can sort of go first. Um, I know we definitely did get hit quite hard by all of the pantry loading, as they call it. 
Um, so I know it did uh, sort of take an effect on our stock levels. Um, for us, it, it's more in the plants themselves actually having space to do the packaging just because we don't have a dedicated packaging line for this. Um, so we are still currently packing by hand, um, which is obviously labor intensive. And this is the only product that we pack that way. Um, and sort of the investment it would take to do it, we'd need to be running significant amount of units to to make it make sense and we're not going to make that investment and have a line that can produce a million reusable containers to only sell a few um mm -hmm. so sort of getting there but um yeah it's been challenges i know that's sort of what our operations team is looking at um quite critically now is how can we sort of improve upon this manual process um with moderate investment um, to sort of help our team to package these uh, loop products a little bit quicker. Um, but yeah, it, it's such a challenge. And even we, we're sort of like approved on one container and we're looking at other options now. And like you said, the timelines for the amount of testing and shelf life testing and transportation testing um, to add another type of container, it's, it's really long. So it, it does take a while. And uh, yeah, I, I totally hear people when they say, we'd love to see more stuff on loop. Um, but yeah, it's definitely like, even if we're working full bore on new products, um, we're still a year plus from being able to actually have them ready. Yeah, agreed. Um, I think what's interesting given we're both food is that it, there's a much higher um, you know, bar for the food manufacturers participating in Loop in terms of making sure the products are are food safe. Um, you know, I laugh, my husband works at Unilever on hair care. He can throw shampoo in any bottle and throw it on Loop because there's no micro, there's no, you know, there's, it's just there's significantly less challenges. Um, and so we want, we want to make sure obviously safety first, you know, even more so in the current situation. Um, so for us, because, you know, as we said, we use the, the same iconic glass bottle and formula. It was about sort of just breaking into a production run to get our, our customized label, um, which again, we seems to be a relatively simple task. But to your point, in the context of COVID and prioritizing, you know, the highest moving SKUs can be a challenge. Um, and, you know, towards the end, working with our loop team, we had a few hiccups of being moved off the production schedule because of this challenge and had to marshal the troops to get us back on, et cetera. Um, but I think also um, as we communicate our, our environmental social governance strategy to the organization, the importance that that plays and why we're doing it, it also helps everyone within the company to feel like they're doing their part. And so when, they, when you say, you know, can you help me throw this back in the schedule? Because it's not efficient. I'm, it's gonna cost you more. You should rather run something X other product. I need you to prioritize this because it's it's part of our ESG agenda. And, you know, we're committed to saying the least right thing to do. So you're asking people to use all of the normal criteria they would to evaluate, you know, what they should do, efficiency, stock levels, you know, um, throw it out the window and do this for me, please, because it's the right thing to do. Um, and if you have everyone engaged in that mission and moving towards our vision. Uh, which is to sustainably grow and delight more consumers globally, then you get more people on board to, to help you when you, you need to call in a favor. Perfect. Oh, Sorry. Oh, Sorry. I just wanted to hop in quickly before we move forward. I know we're um, heading a different direction in a moment, but how much of like it's really actually enlightening. I, I know it's complicated filling the grocery store shelves, but I feel like a lot of this conversation would be great to share with, you know, on social media or on the blog, or actually, is there a, a loop blog? I, I'm not sure. I haven't checked, but I feel like if consumers know that there is this much challenge behind getting this process going, they'll probably be a bit more understanding about like, oh, like I don't have every single product I want to order on Loop, like what the heck, you know? So I'm just curious how much of that communication piece is happening or is in the plan? Um, yeah. I think that that's an excellent point and probably something that, the, that we as Loop could do better um, because if you're not hearing it, it means there's a gap. Um, so for us as Loop, one of the things that we are trying to do is bring awareness to, to what we're doing here, um, because this is a behavior change. 
people are shopping differently. Right now in Loop and in Canada, we're asking people to, to really do two shops, right? Normally you would go to your grocery store and you would shop and you'd go home and use your products. In Loop, what we're seeing is that a consumer buys the Loop products that they can buy, um, noting it's, it's a limited assortment today. And then they need to supplement that shop um, for all of the things that they can't get through Loop. So we're asking people to do two shops instead of one. And that's not easy, right? And that's why we, we really appreciate consumers who are making that effort because it is above and beyond. If I can fast forward and look at what we're seeing in France. So in France, like I said, we launched in May of 2019. And then at the end of last year, we actually went on shelf. So Carrefour, which is like a Loblaws in, in France, um, has dedicated shelf space to loop products. So now as a French consumer, you can go to Carrefour just like you do and you'll buy your loop products. Again, it's not going to be everything that you would normally buy as a consumer, but you would buy your loop products. And then while you're in the store, you would buy the other products that you need to supplement your shop. But now it's gone from two shops to one. And what we've seen is, you know, gradual increase in consumers and shopping. And now that it's on shelf, we're, we're seeing kind of a hockey stick effect. We're seeing um, our retailers get really behind it, giving more shelf space, um, the brands with more shelf space, creating more SKUs and products. So it is natural and it is an evolution that, that will come. And I think something to note as well there is that the Loop store, uh, Ma Boutique Loop in France is, is shut down now, right? So once we have our retail partners directly selling these products to the consumer, again, Loop as a, as a retailer is, is there to test and to learn and to see how the consumer is going to behave. But scalability long term is going to come through the retailer, right? That's what drives it for the consumer. That's what drives it for our brand partners and ultimately for Loop as well. So it's it's a it's a great great point, Tara. Thank you for for sharing that. So I guess let's let's go to the questions. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm going to read it out loud. I don't know if that's obnoxious or not, but uh, um, when this pilot proves successful, what's the plan to build out loot products access on shore, on store shelves and back end capacity? Team up with beer stores. So. Thank you, Gil. I'm, I'm, I think I actually touched on your question um, uh, when I was just filibustering there. But for, for Loop, what we've launched today is the first step towards a broader plan. And that broader plan is to have product on shelf at our, at our retail partners. Um, so that's what the next step is. And it is about just timing and how quickly can we do it? So we're seeing that in some of our other markets, it could be anywhere from a six to 12 month journey from when we launch the loop e-commerce site to when it is in store. And then when it's in store, how do we, how do we grow within the store? Um, in examples that we've had with other retailers around the world, um, loop has a dedicated section in store. So, Typically, you wouldn't see a Kraft Heinz ketchup bottle merchandised beside a Nature's Path cereal. Uh, they're usually in two different sections in two different aisles in the store. But with Loop being new and changing behavior, uh, what we've seen is that there is a Loop section. So you may have beverages and food and personal care products all on the same display to denote that these are all loop products and behave differently than what you would find elsewhere in the store. And it's actually following the, the same path as organic products maybe 20 years ago, where I don't know, if Matt, if, if you were around 20 years ago in Nature's Path, but I'm sure organic products lived in a specific section in the grocery store. And as organic products became more prevalent, they became co-merchandised. So we're seeing that type of, of path with Loop as well. And then the second piece is, is Loop is about an ecosystem as well. So we didn't focus on it at all today, but one of our, our big partners in Canada for Loop is Tim Hortons, right? So will you be able to buy a Tim Hortons cup and drop it off at a Loblaws perhaps? That's our goal, right? We want to create this idea 
that reusability is, a, is as accessible as traditional recyclability. Because today you might walk into an SO gas station and you might walk out with a can of Coke and you might throw that in your recycling bin at home or at work or on the street. We want Loop to be like that as well. So what that means is we need more retailers, we need more partners to build this ecosystem and make it easy and accessible to the consumer. I know I took a lot of airspace there. Um, did anybody want to, to add on to that or shall we move to the next question? All right. Um, maybe. Oh, um, here we go. Sorry, I'm, I'm slow at the wheel today. I apologize, everyone. On the flip side of the scalability component, when it comes to affordability and pricing, how do you see loop packaging affecting the product margins for vendors, retailers, and how much of that co that cost gets passed on to the consumer? Seeing that I just spoke, maybe I'll, I'll pass this over to um, to our brand teams to see how, how they could uh, address this. Um, yeah, I can maybe take first stab at that. Um, I think the real answer is we don't really know as of yet. Um, I think with reusability in general, um, it's not as cut and dry um, in terms of how profitable you'll be. You have to factor in the return rates, which I think sort of ties into um, Tony's previous sentiments of we do need to ensure that we're getting the most of these containers back in order for this whole program to be viable. Um, so until we sort of understand um, the return rates and how long our containers will last in the ecosystem, I don't think we truly know um, how it's going to affect all of our margins. Um, but I would say it has the potential to be better. Like obviously every single use package you put out is just a loss and it's gone forever and you paid the upfront cost usually on something very fancy looking. Um, and so they are kind of expensive. Um, and with reusability, you can keep reusing that assuming you get it back. And so in theory, it can become more profitable. Um, and obviously we would love to keep um, all of our granola as affordable as we possibly can. So I think we kind of just need to kind of continue to test and learn and see um, how that's gonna kind of come out in the wash. Yeah, no, I, I agree with, with what Matt said. Um, I think, as I said before, for the moment, I would say the margins for vendors and retailers are not stellar given the small quantities and the amount of manual um, labor that's involved in the supply chain, be it producing or labeling or sorting or filling. Um, so I think, as Matt said, you know, once we learn sort of all of the economics about the entire loop, um, we'll be able to better build and have a better understanding of those those margins. But right now, I would say they are not good <laughs> for vendors and retailers. Um, and I know as much as possible, we all want to ensure that it doesn't get passed on to consumers. Um, but I think the the way that Loop is structured in terms of the deposit cost and then the product cost, I'm not sure if um, you want to talk to that, Anthony, just reinforcing um, and demonstrating the inherent value in the reusable packaging, I think is really helpful. Um, but obviously it does add an absolute cost increase to the to the basket, although that deposit piece does remain in your account and you know gets credited as you return your product. Um, but I think that's also a little bit of a different dynamic, obviously, than than a traditional transaction with retail and single use. Yeah, that that idea of the deposit is that's the first paradigm shift we had in building this platform. And for those of you who may not know, when, when you buy a product in Loop, you pay for the product. So in the examples we have today, it could be ketchup, it could be um, granola, breakfast cereals. And then you pay a fully refundable deposit to securitize that package because um, that package is, is something that, that is owned by the manufacturer. Um, so it's securitized by deposit that is borne by the consumer, but just like the beer store in Canada, as soon as you bring it back, then you'll get your money back for, for that deposit. I, I don't think we have time for, for any other um, questions. So I just wanted to thank everybody, Tara and Matt and Nicole for, for joining today, um, for asking 
tough questions to to give insights into what look, look, looks like in Canada, and and really to to shine some light on what's coming soon. You know, I think for us, this is the first step in our journey about uh, around reusability. And we need to crawl before we walk, before we run, before we fly. Um, and, and like I said earlier, sometimes the hardest thing, both for the consumer, for the retailer, for our brand partners to do is to start. So we've taken that leap of faith. We've begun this journey. And I think everybody is really excited to see what comes next and how we make this the norm so that we can wake up in 20 years time and it's not about recyclability or waste management. We've attacked the idea of waste at its core, right? Disposability is, is a thing of the past. And something that Tara said that, that I would love to end with is that we as consumers have a ton of power. And when Tara goes into the grocery store and buys produce that's naked, that sends a strong message. To the, to the manufacturers or to the, the merchandisers of that product. And every time we buy something, we're, we're almost voting for that product with our dollars and giving a sign to the manufacturer, to the retailer, that that's what we want to see as consumers. Um, so I, I really love that example, Tara. And, and thank you to, to Nicole and to Matt and to everybody who participated. I hope this was insightful and I hope everybody has um, a wonderful rest of their day. And, and stay safe, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, Thank thanks you, too. Anthony. That was great. Yeah, that was great. Take Bye, care. everyone.